welcome to the Truth Lover video podcast presented by Love and Truth Party. I am your host, Will Pye, author, speaker, transformational coach, workshop and retreat leader and entrepreneur and founder of Love and Truth Party. You can find out more about me at www.willpye.com. Love and Truth Party is a self-organizing, self-replicating community and movement of love and awakening, a wisdom school facilitating health, healing and happiness. Find us and join our mailing list at loveandtruthparty.org. We exist to empower the deep realization and integration of unit of consciousness of one human being and to inspire action in the world from this clarity as new earth ninjas, our playful avatar. Our projects include distributing a million love letters from the universe, inviting people to receive the love and care in these and within the happiness hacks and other free resources found on loveandtruthparty.org. Our online courses, depression diagnosis, what you need to know and how to create happiness, and cancer diagnosis, what you need to know and how to create health, are in production, whilst our monthly meditation and community hangout is at 7 a.m. Melbourne time, first Monday of every month. All details on the website where you can connect with regular updates. We are thrilled. I'm personally really excited to be joined by Martin Ball, PhD today. Martin Ball, PhD, is the author of over 20 books on entheogens, non-duality, and personal transformation, both fiction and non-fiction. He is host of the Entheogenic Evolution podcast. It's an excellent podcast. Organizer of the annual Exploring Psychedelics Conference, a visionary artist, musician, and non-dual guide. On top of all that, he teaches religion at Southern Oregon University, where he lives with his wife, Jessalyn, and son, Jaden, somehow finding time to be a father amidst all of that as well. Uh, his most recent and most popular book is Entheogenic Liberation, Unraveling the Enigma of Non-Duality with 5-MeO-DMT Energetic Therapy. It's currently available in paper book, ebook, and audio book. You can find out more about Martin on Martin Ball. Dot net. Martin, it's a real pleasure to have your wisdom and presence with us today. How are you? I'm doing very well, and thank you very much for inviting me on your show. Um, I've given lots of interviews from Australia, so it's, it's always a pleasure. Someday I hope to actually get there physically, but uh, in the meantime, I always enjoy appearing on the other side of the world via podcast or video or whatever. So thanks for having me on. It's a great pleasure. I can definitely recommend Australia. It's a beautiful part of the world, just like Oregon, where you are. And yeah. we were talking about a, a sort of topic and a title and uh, the entheogenic evolution, the God molecule and non-dual energetic therapy is what we came up with, which just feels like something we could talk about for, 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 for days, uh, potentially. So maybe you could get us started because for me, this is really an area where you have quite, a, quite extraordinary expertise. I saw you speak at the uh, five Mia with the Bufar Alvarez um, symposium in Mexico recently. Mm -hmm. And so for our listeners, perhaps you can give us a brief introduction. This isn't a psychedelic or an entheogenic podcast. So some of us will, of course, have great uh, awareness already around what that title means. But perhaps what, what is an entheogenic evolution? And what is the entheogenic evolution other than the title of your great book? Okay, well, First of all, um, entheogen is a word that was um, created by anthropologists and cultural researchers back, I believe in the 1970s, where, um, so we have this word psychedelic, which means mind manifesting, which is a synonym for the word hallucinogen. So these are substances that create alterations in our perceptions of ourselves, of reality. Um, so things like LSD, psilocybin mushrooms, ayahuasca, um, mescaline, right? These are psychedelics. Um, but the word entheogen was coined because various researchers wanted to move away from the word psychedelic because in the 1960s and 1970s, the word psychedelic became associated with hippies and the counterculture and things like the Grateful Dead and certain styles of art. And it, for many people in the Western world, it was perceived as a form of hedonistic activity, right? Oh, psychedelic. Um, so they created the word entheogen to kind of distinguish between what was currently happening in Western cultures that were embracing psychedelics, such as LSD and psilocybin mushrooms, and they wanted to distinguish the way that psychedelic substances were used in traditional cultures and religions 
which is very different. So in the West, you know, people were taking LSD and going to see the Grateful Dead and getting naked in a field and rolling around in the mud, which maybe wasn't the best representation of psychedelics versus, say, cultures that um, live in the Amazon and have been using ayahuasca for millennia for spiritual purposes, for healing purposes. So they wanted to create a different word to kind of move away from the association of psychedelic. And the word that they chose was entheogen. And this is based off of uh, Greek um, terminology. So en means in, but it's spelled E-N. Theo is the Greek word for God. And then gen, for example, the word genesis, or to generate or to give rise to. So the idea was that psychedelic substances, when used in a traditional or in a spiritual or in a religious or healing context, they said that they experienced uh, generate the experience of God within, or the divine within, or the sacred within. So there's different ways that you could gloss the term theo. I mean, literally, it does mean God in Greek. Um, so I started my podcast, The Entheogenic Evolution, um, in late 2007, early 2008. So it's been over 10 years now that I've been doing the podcast. And I chose the name Entheogenic Evolution because I wanted to sort of emphasize the idea that you know, what we're currently undergoing is what's called the psychedelic renaissance. So this is kind of a phenomenon that's happening around the world where people are rediscovering psychedelics. There's a new wave of research into the medical and psychological benefits and also social benefits of use of psychedelics and look at how they're used in traditional cultures and how they can be used in therapeutic contexts. So there's an idea that um, psychedelics are being reintroduced. So with the entheogenic evolution, kind of taking it a step further and saying that use of psychedelics is actually integral to the evolution of human beings. And as I see it, um, you know, potentially they were significant in the human past um, of helping to develop culture, religion, um, things like that. But then also, how do we move into perhaps a new era for humanity and what role might entheogens play within that. So that's why I came up with a name for that. And that um, these substances, when used in an intentional way, you know, there's all different kinds of ways that psychedelics can be used. You can take them to go see the Grateful Dead. You can take them and go wander around at Burning Man and enjoy the art. Um, you can go on a hike, right? There's all different kinds of ways that you can use them. But when used for personal transformation, they're incredibly powerful tools. And so kind of looking at the question of, if they were more easily accessible within culture and not just from the more hedonistic or, or personal use side, but for the transformative side, what could that potentially do to human culture and society? That's a great question to ponder. And I think anyone that's experienced these and you know, speaking with the power of language, these, these sacraments, you could say, rather than, uh, rather than drugs would, uh, have a sense of what that potential might be. And this, this term, the God molecule, which refers to very often DMT rather than necessarily 5 Mio, as I understand it, is a pretty loaded term. And you've talked about in Theo, its literal meaning being accessing the God within. And this is, I think, quite exciting because on the one hand, it's going to be provocative and turn off any fundamentalist religious types who would say that their uh, God is, is God and certainly not accessible via a substance. Um, and simultaneously, we'll turn off a lot of the sort of new age people who would say, well, you know, what's, what's, what's God got to do with anything? It's, it's an outdated concept. So right. I wonder if you can speak to that tension and, and, and why this phrase, the God molecule, might be justified in some way. Okay. Um, so as far as I know, I'm the person who coined that phrase. Um, I've said this before on other shows, and I just I want to admit that I could be wrong about that, but I do believe that I was the first person to use the phrase the God molecule, and it was from my podcast. Um, back in 2008, uh, when I was first experiencing 5-methoxydimethyltryptamine, 5-MeO-DMT, um, by that point, uh, many people knew what DMT was, which more accurately is NNDMT. So for anybody who's a fan of Terrence McKenna, for example, that's what he liked to talk about all the time, was smoking DMT and seeing machine elves, things like that. And also it was popularized through um, the book, The Spirit Molecule, which was written by Rick Strassman, who was the first person in about 25 years to do any kind of scientific research um, 
into psychedelics using human subjects. So he did this test uh, here in the United States where he was injecting people with DMT. And it was a very modest study. He was just looking to see if any kind of resistance built up within the body or if every time you gave somebody an NDMT, they'd have the same a level of experience if there was some kind of diminishing over time. And what he concluded is that there is no tolerance to NNDMT. So it doesn't matter how many times you take it, it's just as powerful every time. Um, and through his research, he ended up calling it the spirit molecule. And he introduced a lot of hypotheses about when does quote unquote the spirit enter into the body and achieve consciousness and kind of, kind of a mixture of um, biology and also Tibetan Buddhism um, hypothesizing that there's some kind of flood of DMT into the human embryo um, at 49 days, which is when, according to Tibetan Buddhism, uh, consciousness re-enters into a new body after death, have you passed through the Bardo states. Um, and then he also speculated that perhaps there is a flood of NNDMT that's produced within the brain when people are dying, and it produces these near-death experiences or out-of-body experiences. So he was trying to s hypothesize that there's a connection between the spirit and the body that is mediated through this molecule of NNDMT. And one of the reasons for that is that NNDMT is produced by the human body. It's a natural human neurotransmitter. So currently, all human beings on the planet have NNDMT inside their bodies, OK? Um, but a very small trace amounts. Um, and there is, does seem to be some evidence that perhaps during near-death experiences or spontaneous visionary states that we actually produce an excess of NNDMT in the body. And so it might be responsible um, for these kinds of experiences that people have. So anyway, um, to get back to your question, after my first few experiences with 5-MeO-DMT, which again, this was um, back in early 2008, most people had never really heard of it. But on my podcast, I said, well, look, if, if NNDMT is, quote unquote, the spirit molecule, and also because, you know, when people smoke it or when they take it or inject it or however they're using it, it's very common for people to report um, seeing spirits or entities or deities or aliens or, you know, very famously, Terrence McKenna and his idea of machine elves. So I said, well, if NNDMT is the spirit molecule, then 5-MeO-DMT is the God molecule. And my reason for saying that is because um, in contrast to NNDMT, which is very highly visual and also very rarely dissolves the ego so that most experiences with NNDMT fall on what we could say are the dualistic side of things, where there's a sense of subjectivity and also a sense of the witnessing of objects or other beings or entities within that space. So there's still a sense of self and other that exists where, there, and subject and object. And I am looking at this, like Terence McKenna would say, I saw the machine elves in hyperspace. So we have a place, we have a subject, we have an object. But with 5-MeO-DMT, if someone can really let go into the experience, it completely dissolves the ego. So there's no sense of subjective self, or at least any normal sense of subjective self, is obliterated. So for example, many people, when they smoke 5-MeO-DMT, from the perspective of the ego, they feel like they're dying and merging with the infinite. And often it's not visual. So it's often just described as being a void or just empty space or pure light or pure consciousness, pure being, pure energy, infinite love. But it's also experienced as being alive and sentient and aware. So for example, for me, the first time that I had a full 5-MeO-DMT experience. Just to distinguish, is there a distinction you're making there between a, a full experience or a full release was the uh, ingestions you had prior which didn't quite take you to the to the, the purity yes yes that i had had a few experiences with 5-meo dmt um, prior to this full release dose and i really didn't think that much of it because it see there's this threshold and you if you don't cross the threshold um it's just it's not the full experience. Okay, I like to refer to it as like 
the event horizon of a black hole. That, um, you know, from physics, the idea is that a black hole, you know, the gravity keeps everything behind that event horizon. So we can't actually see a black hole, right? Because there's this event horizon. We can't look in there and see what's going on. 5-MeO DMT is like that, and especially the, the notion of ego death is like that. Everything on this side of the divide is mediated through the ego, and it's a dualistic experience of self and other, subject and object. But when you dissolve that distinction between self and other and subject and object, then you enter into the non-dual experience. And nothing, absolutely nothing at all, on the dualistic side of that equation can inform you about what the non-dual experience is like. And this is a little frustrating for people because you have to tell them that, look, if you haven't had the experience, you literally have no idea what I'm talking about. You cannot conceptualize what this experience is like. So I had had a few experiences with 5-MeO-DMT prior to this first full release dose, and they were all on the dualistic side of things where Martin was having this experience, okay? But when I had my full release dose of 5-MeO-DMT, Martin dissolved. And as he was dissolving, he just blurted out, thank you, God. And then I went into this state of just absolute gratitude, absolute divine bliss. It was just because there was no longer me in the universe. It was just everything was one. It was this one infinite being and consciousness that was aware, that was conscious, and that was made out of the pure energy of love. And, you know, eventually my ego came back from that. I was like, that's unbelievable. How is this even possible? Um, and for me, you know, going into this experience, I never used the word God, ever. Because, well, that sounds like Christianity. It sounds like Islam. It sounds like Judaism. It sounds like the Western tradition that, it, you know, has this really silly book of all these old fables that people think are literally true. So, you know, in some ways, I was very anti-God. I was, you know, younger. I identified as an atheist. I had become a Buddhist. Um, which doesn't have the, the theistic God figure in it. But after this experience, for me, it was just, oh my God, God's real. And it's not some transcendent deity. It's not some dude with a beard floating up on the clouds. It's, it's a non-dual understanding of God. And so the simplest way to describe this linguistically is just to say that God is all of reality, that there's only one being, only one consciousness that is everyone and everything. And as human beings, through the mask of our ego, through our mask of our self-created sense of a separate identity, we kind of mask over this universal feature of ourself that we're not aware of it. But when you dissolve the ego, then it just becomes immediately obvious that, oh, there's just one being, there's one consciousness, and that's all things, including me and including everything I ever see or interact with. And so that's why I coined that term of the God molecule. And I, I wanted to distinguish it from NNDMT, also because people like Terrence McKenna were really promoting NNDMT and saying, you know, this is the top of the line, that there's nothing, there's no more significant psychedelic molecule on planet Earth than NNDMT. And I thought that the God molecule was a bit more forceful of a term than the spirit molecule that in, I actually intended it to be somewhat challenging to people, especially when you know, people like me formerly would say, hey, man, don't talk to me about God. You know, I don't want to hear that stuff. Um, and, but I do think that it's a very accurate descriptor. So in some ways, I'm trying to take the word God back and then reuse it in this non-dualistic sense, which is not the way it's been used in Western traditions and cultures, which is very dualistic, where God is seen as something other, a separate or transcendent, that God creates reality, then exists outside of reality. Whereas I'm saying God is reality. There is no separation. There, there's nothing that transcends this being because it is all things. And the idea, the traditional idea of God, you were speaking about there, how the ego masks our experience of pure being. I think often the idea of God or the concept of God also obscures that experience or obscures that insight. Often there's no path of uh, realization offered within traditions. And 
so it's called, it's, kind of, it's almost like God is a blasphemy as it's often used, particularly when it's talked about judgment and fear and wrath and so on. And what I'm hearing you speak of is something quite different. And it's also, as you pointed to non-conceptual, we hear in psychedelic terms that something is, is translingual. And in my experience, it seems that five Mio is uh, that and then some. It, it's even more beyond the realms of language or concepts than any other experience that is possible to have. And this is just kind of fascinating. Like, how is it that this experience can arise completely beyond any words? And yet somehow we can, we can point to it, we can have these conversations. And I'm just, I just find this so, so fascinating. And I wonder what you would say to someone who perhaps has been searching for God or has been searching for truth. Is five Mio the answer? Is this uh, a, a sacrament and initiation that we should be seeking to roll out to more and more people? Well, my general attitude there is, is yes, that um, it makes this fundamental nature of reality accessible to people in a way that is relatively easy. And that what we're doing is we're introducing a neurotransmitter into the human system. And also, I want to add that like NNDMT, 5-MeO-DMT is naturally produced inside the human body. So there's nothing alien or foreign about it in that sense, that it's part of our natural human biochemistry. Usually, we just have very small trace amounts. Um, and it makes this non-dual experience available, at least in theory, to anyone. Now, that doesn't mean that everybody who takes 5-MeO-DMT has a full non-dual experience, because it's always possible for the ego to hold on and for the ego to fight with the experience and for people to resist it. Um, it can't overwhelm your ego unless you agree to that. And if, if you let yourself die within that experience um, is just a simple way to put it. But people can fight all the way through. So it, it's not an automatic result. You can't just give somebody 5-MeO-DMT and then they have a full non-dual experience. Now that can happen, but something within that person has to allow that to take place. They have to give up any sense of resistance that they might have. They have to go fully into trust and they have to allow that to take place. So again, it's not, it's not fully mechanical, but it does provide the opportunity for that experience to occur. And it's simply easier than say, for example, many meditation traditions especially coming out of the East, such as Hinduism, Buddhism, they um, promote the non-dual experience as an experience of enlightenment, as the revealing of the true nature of being, the true nature of reality. And in most Buddhist and Hindu traditions, what they recommend is years and years and years and years of meditating in order to have that experience, to relax the mind enough so that you can have this full experience of the nature of being. And within those traditions, it, they also talk about how it will take you multiple lifetimes, which actually is it's a position I disagree with. I don't, I don't believe in reincarnation at an individual level. But the way that they talk about it, it's so hard to attain that state that they say it will take you thousands and thousands of lifetimes of meditating and practicing before you're able to have the full experience. Versus here with 5-MeO-DMT, in the right situation, in the right context, like with me in that first full 5-MeO-DMT experience, I went into a non-dual state with virtually no effort on my own part within a matter of seconds versus lifetimes of meditation and contemplation. So it just makes it far more accessible to people. Similarly, a, a friend of mine had sat uh, Vipassana. He was a, very much a Vipassana devotee. I think one of the most uh, meditated consciousnesses I know, perhaps 30 to 40,000 hours. And one would assume, and he certainly would suggest, had a fair bit of insight during that time frame. And then he did 5-Meo DMT. And it was a whole new dimension uh, something that he hadn't discovered before, even with that incredible depth of intensity of practice. Yeah, I actually think that 5-MeO allows people to go farther and deeper 
into the fullness of that experience than any other methodology. I don't think that you can actually reach those same levels just via meditation. Now, I would also say that um, this is something that I think really deserves further scientific study. I think that people who do have very deep meditations and do experience some level of non-duality are probably experiencing the biological production of more 5-MeO-DMT in their system at that time. Because, you know, when you look at traditional descriptions of the non-dual state as achieved through meditation, they talk about, like in the Tibetan Buddhist tradition, they talk about the clear white light of the mind, which is called Rigpa. And that is a perfect description of the full 5-MeO-DMT experience. It's just this pure, crystalline, clear white light. But I think that it's more energetically charged than um, achieving those states of non-dual awareness through meditation, which is a very calming practice. But here through 5-MeO-DMT, what you're doing is you're raising these levels of energy up to what we could describe as being an infinite level. So it's far more en energetically charged. And I will say that having done seven years of one-on-one -on -one work with clients working with 5-MeO-DMT, I worked with a lot of people who came from meditation traditions and mystical traditions, um, often people who had no prior psychedelic experience, and also people with years and years and years of psychedelic experience. And I even had people who came to me saying, oh, well, I've had a non-dual experience before. I've had a unitary experience before. Not one single person that I worked with, no matter what their background was, not one of them ever said they experienced anything like the 5-MeO-DMT experience. And they all agreed that it was infinite levels beyond anything previous within their experience. And the, again, even this was people who had spent 30, 40 years meditating. So it is an accelerator to get people into this state. And there's many values to this, but one of the primary values is that it allows you to experience the fundamental nature of the self. And that puts all of your personal beliefs and perspectives and desires and likes and dislikes, it puts all of it into a perspective that really shows the constructed nature of all of these things. That you know, we really tie ourselves to our beliefs and our identities and our values. And this just says, oh yeah, all of that is just this little creation you made for yourself. And so it really allows for a fundamental reorientation towards yourself, towards other people, towards reality as a whole. And so it, I think it's the most significant transformative tool that exists within reality. I don't think anything else even comes close to 5-methoxydimethyltryptamine. And you use the word transformative and the, the truth of this word, the power of this word and its literal meaning to actually change the physiology, to change the form through which it is ingested. And it seems that that's a, an aspect of the experience that's so powerful and so unique. It, 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 uh, it's embodied, it's somatic, all of the energy systems, the whole, every aspect of anything that we could identify or think of as, or experience as being what we are is fully, fully engaged. And um, yeah, I, I, the, the uniqueness of that um, is, is, is something to behold. And the, the quality of love in that that you spoke of is something to behold as well. Something not insignificant as we posit it, this in, a, in an evolutionary or a sort, of, sort of sense of the fundamental insight that human beings might take back. Like, what is the nature of God? What is the nature of reality? It does seem from the five me of experience in my case, and I hear from a lot of other people and hear you pointing to as well, that the quality of love is fundamental. Yeah, it, it really, really is that really for me, the best way to describe reality is that it's love interacting with itself, that love is the fundamental energy of all being of all consciousness. And the way, the way just, to, just to throw one other little bit of poetry in there, when I came out of the experience, God making love with itself, or if I'm in a cheeky yes. mood, it's all God fucking itself. It's all God uh, enjoying itself. Yes. And, you know, as individual embodiments of this one universal consciousness and being, all of us experience things that we like 
and things that we don't like, and then things that we feel that we love or things that we think that we hate and things that we think are good versus things that we think are bad. And we use that to motivate our actions and our beliefs in the way that we treat ourselves, the way that we treat others. But when you go into this full state of everything is love, it kind of go back to what I said before, it puts your own personal beliefs and preferences into perspective. So then you can think about, oh, well, I hate this thing whatever that may be. I hate this thing over here. Um, or I hate these other people, or I hate it when I do this, or I hate it when those people do that. And then you can start to take responsibility for that. Because if the true nature of all things is love, if I'm busy hating something, I'm actually going against the flow of reality. I'm going against the fundamental nature of reality. And we're free to do that. We can hate as much as we want. But that's always wrapped up in some kind of egoic image that we have of self versus other. And when we move beyond that, then we can learn that well, yeah, you can actually love everything. You can love everyone. And it, that also doesn't mean that you have to just throw out your own personal preferences and desires. Um, but anytime that we're actively hating something, that's something that we need to feed constantly. So one of the ways I'd like to describe it is that loving things takes absolutely no energy whatsoever because that's the fundamental nature of reality. And we can see this in kids, for example. Little kids are just, they're amazed by everything. They love everything. They love everyone. I mean, my son, Jaden, all the time, he, just, he it's so funny. He's really cute where he says, I love everyone, including myself. You know, he, <laughs> awesome. he just says this, this little kid. But you know, there's not a single child on the planet who's racist or sexist or homophobic or ethnocentric or tied to some political or religious ideology that tells them that they have to hate this certain group of people. You have to learn how to hate. You have to construct your identity around that hate. Like here in the United States, we're currently going through this resurgence of neo-Nazis. And they've got to work really hard to fuel that level of hate and fear and animosity towards others. Um, and again, no child is born that way. Um, and I think that because they're just more naturally in the flow of things, right? That they don't have a solid personal sense of identity. They haven't really formed their ego around their belief system because they don't really have a belief system. They're just experiencing things as they are. And so for adults, this is a way for us to re-experience that and to, in a sense, kind of fundamentally reset because we carry around all of our illusions and our projections and our hates and our fear and we internalize all of that and then we go on into adulthood and then we find ourselves just trapped in this prison of misery and judgment where we're judging ourselves, we're judging others, we're rejecting things, we're chasing after the things that we want and it runs us ragged. As adults, but here through these psychedelic medicines, and in particular 5-MeO DMT, it provides this incredible reset for people. Well, you know, after that, of course, these habits are going to reform for most people. And so it takes work to really dissolve these egoic structures. And it's not something that just happens like boom, you take 5-MeO DMT once and that stuff never never bothers you again. But it at least allows you to start over again. And then you can use that as an opportunity to really observe yourself, observe your belief patterns, observe the ways that you think about things, the ways that you feel about things. And then you can start to feel when you're going into your own personal narrative and moving away from that universal current of love and back into hate and fear and anxiety. And so that you can use that as a way to self-correct yourself. And the more you use the medicine, the more you work with it and observe how your ego dissolves, how your ego comes back and the games that your uh, ego plays, the more you can free yourself from them. So I also see it as a tool to really fundamentally help people liberate themselves from themselves, from the illusions that they've created for themselves and thereby making people happier healthier and more grounded in reality, which I think we could really use at an extensive level where we are at currently in human societies that 
we need more of this, not less. Oh, I wholeheartedly agree. I think uh, who could not? There was something you pointed to earlier on, which I'd like to hear more from you on. And it's this mysterious aspect of, you use the word trust, but further surrender. And just mm -hmm. now in the reset, you're very much speaking or pointing to or evoking the notion of rebirth, of being reborn. And in that moment of resistance or surrender, I think you use the language that there's something within the human or something within the individual that lets go or, or doesn't let go. And the not letting go, we could probably say, well, quite easily, that's the egoic structure. It's you know, the body system of, of fearing death or something like this. What is it that might let go? What is it that actually allows someone to be faced with nothingness and somehow go, yeah, <laughs> bring it on? <laughs> well, you know, yeah, what is that? I mean, that's a really excellent question. And it's actually related to a question that people ask me a lot because I do, you know, spend a lot of time talking about non-duality. And so people kind of treat me as this question and answer guy. And one of the things that I get a lot is people ask me about, well, does free will really exist? And, and a lot of people have a question about that or have an issue with that. And my answer to that is absolutely free will exists. And so this is what we're talking about here, see? that free will, the ability to choose, is a quality of the universal intelligence, which I like to call God. And that God cannot violate its own free will. So that free will is a fundamental aspect that we get to choose. Now, we don't get to choose everything. Like, I don't get to choose my hair color or whether I lose my hair or, you know, not. I don't get to choose um, how tall I am. I don't get to choose if I get to fly or not because that's without of the range of where I can apply my ability to choose. But I can choose where I put my attention. I can choose whether to fear or hate things. I get to choose how I react. I get to choose whether I'm protecting myself energetically or whether I'm opening myself up energetically. So there are a lot of areas that we do get to choose. And when it comes to the experiences of 5-MeO-DMT, people hold on energetically, they keep themselves within the egoic character for a wide variety of reasons. The deepest reason is this issue of trust, of can I just allow myself to experience what I'm experiencing without fighting with it? So here I like to use kind of an analogy of going on a roller coaster, right? which is kind of like 5-MeO-DMT in the sense that you can feel it coming on. So the roller coaster is going up, click, 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 click. It's going up to the top. And right there at the top, people have a choice that they can make. And, you know, for people who love roller coasters, they don't even think of it as a choice. They're just like, no, man, I just love this. But some people get up there and all of a sudden, I mean, I've seen this at amusement parks. I, I um, grew up in Santa Cruz, California during the summers and they have, um, a big wooden roller coaster there. And I've actually seen people on their roller coaster that when they get to that top before they go down, some people are screaming like, no, let me off. I can't do it. Let me off. And other people are just crying and they're screaming the whole way. And the person next to them is like, yeah, yeah. And they're having the best time because they're trusting that they're going to be okay, that it's going to be fun, that it's going to, it's going to do something for them that they enjoy. So they're not fighting with the experience, but other people choose to fight with the experience because they're afraid and they're not trusting it. And so 5-MeO is very similar to that, where you have this sense of, oh my God, everything is expanding out into infinity. My whole sense of self-identity is dissolving away. And the ego says, and I'm never coming back from this and I'm going to be gone forever. Some people are able to just say, yes, I'm going to allow this to take place. And other people say no. And then they use different things to hold on to that sense of no. Maybe it's just, I don't like this. I don't want this. So there's this energetic rejection that takes place that says, no, push it away. Or I've seen this often with people who are parents where they're starting to go into that full non-dual state. And the ego says, you're never coming back from this, so you're never going to see your kids again. And then people think, no, no, I've got to see my kids again. Um, so there's all different kinds of reasons and ways that people can resist that. But it does just come down to this fundamental choice, which, again, 
I would say is just a fundamental aspect of the absolute nature of being is that we do get to choose. And since we get to choose, 5-MeO-DMT can't override your free will in that sense. You have to allow it to overtake you. Otherwise, you can just fight with it all the way through. And just for any listeners who have never experienced this, um, the advice, of course, is to trust, relax, and let go because fighting with it is the most miserable experience. It's, it's horrendous. People describe it as going through hell. It's very, very challenging for people. But if you can relax within it, then it's just this experience of infinite love. And it's really, it's the most profound thing. And as you said earlier, words can't describe it. You know, like I can say it's infinite, but we just have little metaphors that we use for what we think is infinite, but it really is infinite. Um, and once you've experienced that, then you can say, yeah, that's a good word. That's a good word for it. But we can't have an idea of what's infinite because by definition, if we have an idea of something, we have an idea of some thing, which is locked into duality, subject, object. But here, infinite means everything, all time, all space, all reality, infinitely, forever. We can't have a concept of that, but you can experience it directly. And then we can try and use language to capture this and express it as best that we can. But understanding that it's just an approximation, that we're not, we can't literally describe what this experience is that you, you, you either have it or you don't. And once you've had it, then you can kind of talk about it, um, but even then it's still difficult. I, I love the metaphor of the roller coaster and then you spoke of trusting, relaxing, letting go. And it seems like this is kind of a metaphor or a guidance for life itself as well. Ultimately, we can resist, we can be uh, bemoaning the fact that we experience pain and, and death and rejection and abandonment and all these things, or we can ultimately trust, relax and let go and, and, and enjoy it. And it seems like the, five meo experience gives us that as a somatic cellular truth it gives it to us on in a way that is uh transcendent of the usual filters and, and, and ways that we might modulate or, or 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 reject or minimize that experience and one word that you used as a consequence of the experience was this unspeakable gratitude and yes Gratitude is my kind of my thing. It's my I'm Will Pye, the gratitude guy on Instagram. I, I love gratitude. And I was really, I'd like to hear more of how that unfolded for you. Either, I think you used the word at that point of, of about to go over the roller coaster, um, perhaps then and perhaps afterwards. Can you speak more to how, how you have received the gift of this experience of five Mia? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, First, I just want to circle back around to something you just said about how this teaches us about how to be more relaxed and trusting in our lives. And I think that that's really one of the greatest significances of these kinds of experiences. Um, because often they're described as kind of far out and really wild and like non-ordinary. And it's important to recognize that it's all just an amplification of our everyday experience. And that it's it's amplified to these infinite levels so it feels very different and very unique but everything that we learn from these experiences applies to everyday moments are we relaxed are we centered are we present are we allowing what is taking place and being present with it and not fighting with it even if we don't like it or are we spinning ourselves out um you know so that these are practical everyday lessons it's not just this wild psychedelic reality that this has to do with how we carry ourselves moment to moment, day to day throughout our lives. So then back to the idea of gratitude. Well, I'm sure that most people can identify with this that, you know, we have disappointments, we have judgments, we have failures, we have internal and external critiques. Um, you know, we might not feel good enough or worthy enough or, we haven't lived up to our potential or we've been a failure or we've been bad or, you know, whatever it may be. Um, and we have, you know, when you look back in your life, you say, Oh, well, I like that, but man, this other part really sucked and this was terrible and I was all depressed and I was sad. And so there's, you know, there's all this spectrum of ways that we've experienced our lives. And sometimes what that translates into um, is people get angry with themselves they get angry with the people around them. 
Um, they find somebody to blame, whether it's themselves or those other people, they did it to me or this context that did it to me. And we develop all these judgments. And, and then again, we get fear and we get hate and we have to feed these things. And people get bitter. Um, People get angry. People get angry at God. Like, you know, this expression, oh, God, why did you do this to me? Why did you do this to me? And we get bitter and we get judgmental about that. Well, for me, when this first 5-MEO experience, the full 5-MEO experience was just this absolute sense of gratitude of God, this universal intelligence, has invested itself in being me and in living the life that I've identified with. So, wow, thank you. Thank you, God, for being me, Martin, and thank me for being you. And then seeing how everything that happened in my life had led me up into the point of where I was willing to take 5-MeO DMT and have this experience and just, oh, thank, thank God for everything. Even the things that made me sad, or depressed, or feel like a failure, that everything, you could see how everything brought me to the point where I was. And this was, I just had so much gratitude for everything. And then in this realization that everything is God and everything is love, it's just, oh, I love everything. And like, I had to admit it to myself, like, I really do love everything. And just thank you for giving me the opportunity to admit to myself that I actually am just in this state of infinite love all the time. And, and it put all my little petty ideas, put everything into perspective, like, man, I was, I was so attached to being me and the ideas of people who have wronged me or the injustice in the world or whatever. And it's like, oh, I can let all of that go. And again, it doesn't mean that I need to like everything but I don't need to identify with my own pain and suffering and injustice. And so it's, it's so profoundly healing, you know, and for many people, this, this healing aspect takes the form of purging where people just feel like the entire universe is turning inside out through them and they're letting go of all the shit they've been holding on to their whole lives. And it just comes pouring out of them and you feel clean, you feel remade and and if that doesn't inspire gratitude, then, you know, you're probably out of luck because I don't know what we, any of us could be more grateful for. And then even within that, the realization that, well, if God be afraid about if I'm doing it right. I mean, that's a big part, especially of religion in the West, is this idea of you've got to do it right or you're going to be punished, right? That there's this judgment that's coming. And it really puts into perspective that the only judgment is the judgment you make for yourself or that you buy into from other people. And you say, oh, I'm going to agree with this person over here that I have this judgment. About myself. It's your responsibility. There's this level of presence and peace and centeredness within yourself that you cannot get from anything else. And that it also puts into perspective that much of the religious impulse is a diversion from this because it's like I'm trying to please God and I'm trying to do everything. It says here, it's made it all right. And I'll check that one. Back. You know, it reminds me if you guys have The Simpsons in Australia. Familiar Absolutely. with The Simpsons? Absolutely. The TV show? Yeah. Okay. So, you know, Ned Flanders, he's the good Christian. <laughs> and it always makes me think of this one Simpsons episode where, where a tornado comes in and a tornado passes over Homer Simpson's house and goes to Ned Flanders' house and destroys his house. And then Ned is like, God, do another, right? And so the five meal experience is the opposite of this. It's realizing, well, there is nothing I need to do to please God. I have to please myself. I have to love myself and stop putting it on God, save me, Jesus, save me, Buddha, save me, Krishna, save me, 
Am I good enough? Am I worthy? You know, and kind of overcoming these beliefs that we have about ourselves. So it's very empowering that it's to love and forgive ourselves and to be true to ourselves and be authentic uh, with ourselves. Um, so it's just, again, it's the most powerfully transformative experience that's really available to humans. And just the potential is tremendous for, for what it can do for humanity and for individuals. And let's talk about that potential in a moment. I just wanted to draw a comparison with the, the great uh, Ned Flanders example. We've also mentioned earlier on in this conversation, people who have done a huge amount of meditation. So they've, they, they've done what God wanted, as it were. They've, 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 they've been the good boy with their uh, 20,000 hours, <clears throat> excuse me, yeah. and then discovered this, this experience that has delivered them more than that. Um, and in my experience, observing this uh and i think it's the same when someone comes to meditation and has a natural inclination and has a a non-dual realization within uh you know, within six months of practice that there's a an amusement rather than a frustration or an anger it's kind of like a getting the joke it was like oh right okay <laughs> how funny how funny <laughs> um at least that's yeah well I mean. one of the thing yeah one of the things that it reveals is that since it is this aspect of surrender, right, where you let go and you trust, what it reveals is that there isn't anything that the ego can do to make this experience happen. And that's kind of we're trying to do things. So they're practicing this meditation and going to that workshop and studying this philosophy and reading these books and listening to these podcasts you know, not to diminish the fact that either you and I uh, do podcasts that people listen to for these kinds of reasons. But the point is that all of that is effort by the ego. And what 5-MeO-DMT reveals is that the only way to really have this experience is for the ego just to, just to let go and I'm not trying to hang on. I'm just going to be with what is. And so this it's this deep level of relaxation that occurs. And then the joke is that, man, I was really running myself ragged trying to have this experience and also trying to maintain my social self and all the rest of that. And it really is this really funny joke because from, from the other side of it, it's like, oh man, I'm God and I totally forgot about it. So I invested in myself in the belief that I was this human being. And then I created religion for myself. And, and I told I, myself I was supposed to do all these things and achieve all this stuff. And it's all just a game. I'm just playing a game with myself. And I'm doing it in this loving and almost like wicked and ironic sense where like from... I'm playing both sides of the game board simultaneously, but I keep forgetting that I'm doing that. And so I keep, you know, like winking at myself and then I slap myself around a little bit. Um, and it just re reveals sort of the absurdity of all of it and the amount of energy and belief we invest into our delusional side of the game. And it, and it just comes back with, like, like this one guy I had a session with several years ago. In the middle of the session, he's just... I don't have to do anything. I don't have to do anything. And he was just ecstatic because that's, that's the big reveal is like, guess what? Like everybody who's striving to be enlightened, the big joke is that you actually already are. You just don't realize it because you're so invested in the character of who it is that you think that you are. And that character is working so hard to be enlightened. And if you just stopped trying everything, then it just arises and you're like, there was nothing I needed to do. I've been working my whole life, but there was nothing I needed to do. And again, 5-MeO-DMT doesn't make this experience. It just provides an opportunity for you to kind of fall into it and realize, oh, this is the way it's always been. And it, it amplifies that reality as a neurotransmitter, it changes our energetic state to amplify that reality, but it doesn't create it, right? It's not, quote unquote, produced by a drug. This is a neurotransmitter that shifts our energetic experience that 
gives us the opportunity to simply observe what already is and then rest within that reality. Mm -hmm. Hard to speak words after, after those. But I do want to hear something from you around, uh, we touched on that sense of potential mm -hmm. and the evolutionary function. And I had a conversation with a lady, uh, Jude Caravan, recently, a planetary healer, author, extraordinary woman. And she, in uh, a, a talk, so it's perfectly fine to, to share this publicly, mm -hmm. she said, um, I was having a conversation with an ET the other day. And this, is, this is great. She's uh, you know, an Oxford-educated PhD, um, very respectable uh, middle-class English lady. And she just drops into this conversation that, oh, I was having a conversation with an ET the other day. And the ET had been on a similar path as the, uh, or their culture had been on a similar path that humanity is right now, kind of destroying itself uh, with insanity and, and craziness. And she said, what did, what did you guys do? Because you, you came through the other side, you evolved somehow, you shifted out of the, the crisis into, into greater collective harmony. What did you do? What was the key? And then the ET apparently responded to her, we realized unit of consciousness. Yeah. And that's a, it's, it's an anecdote of a lady talking to an ET, but it does point to something that resonates with me as being true, which 5MEO facilitates, of course, that realization of one consciousness, of one human being. I wonder if that is the, the gist of, or the juice of how 5MEO evolutionarily is going to serve our collective unfolding. What do you reckon? I mean, particularly with, with, with relation to our considerable challenges and crises that we uh, are, are facing. Yeah, I think it is an absolutely fundamental tool um, to assist in this process. And I do think that unitive consciousness is really the only way out. Look, religions have had their turn, in a sense. Um, political systems have had their turn. Economic systems have had their turn. And what we can see that economic systems, political systems, and religious systems have all propped up divisions within humanity. Because people say, my religion is right, your religion is wrong, my politics are right, your politics are wrong, my economic system is right, your economic system is wrong. So it sets up all of these divisions of right and wrong, good and bad, and also divide us from the natural world. Mm. And we can see now, just globally speaking, especially in Western European democracies, we see the rise, the resurgence of nationalism and race, racial and religious identity politics. We also see this in the Middle East um, with uh, religious identity politics, terrorism, uh, Shias versus Sunnis, Christians versus uh, Muslims, uh, Christians versus Jews, uh, immigrants versus native born citizens, Americans against everybody now, I guess, because of President Trump. Um, so it's all this divisiveness everywhere. And it's all about my tribe, my group, we're the ones that we've got it. And we, we have to have power over everybody else. We have to push everybody else away. And then we also have set it up as, well, we can't, like one of Trump's big things here in the United States is he's trying to get rid of all environmental protection regulations and he says because it hurts business and so we have basically humanity against the environment you know are we going to have a good economy or are we going to have a good environment and trump is basically saying well screw the environment let's just have a good economy um and so it's it's all these zero-sum games where it's all based on the sense of division and separation and no political, social, or religious system has been able to overcome that. And even some of the ones that have the greatest potential, like say Buddhism, um, has a very good basis in non-duality. Yet if we look at what's going on in Myanmar, where Buddhists are perpetuating ethnic cleansing against Muslims. So guess what? They failed. Because Buddhism is supposed to teach about non-duality and the sense of otherness as being an illusion and a creation of the ego. So all of these systems have essentially failed, I think. And we are at a point where either we can get our shit together and overcome our illusions of separation and our hate and our fear and um, the way that we judge ourselves and judge others and separate ourselves from the environment, 
or we can overcome that and in a sense, kind of like with 5-MeO, start again, start fresh. And I think that 5-MeO is fundamental for that. And, you know, I, I, I like to stay away from teleological reasoning, you know, that this happened for this purpose or something like that. But, you know, I think that one of the reasons that 5-MeO DMT is becoming more well known now at this point in history, even though it's been around forever, it's people are learning about it now because in a sense, this is what we need now, that it, it helps people to overcome their illusions of separateness and to directly experience the infinite nature of divine love and unconditional love. And that is what the world needs and that it's accessible through a molecule. So it's accessible to everyone. You don't have to believe anything. You don't have to identify with any particular group. You don't have to follow any guru or any religious leader or subscribe to any doctrine or dogma. You don't have to go to church. You don't have to do any of these things. You just have to be willing to take this medicine, and I like the term medicine because I do think it's very healing, and surrender. And if you can do that, you'll have this experience and it will change your life. So for most people who have 5-MeO-DMT, their life is cut in half. In the sense that, well, there was my life before, before I had this experience, and there's my life after. after. And if more people had this experience, it would fundamentally change the way that people relate to themselves, the way that they relate to the environment, the way that they look at the entire universe, and how we organize ourselves socially and culturally and politically. And it just, it has so much potential because it takes you, you know, for, for so many people, there's this question, well, does God exist? Does God not exist? Is, you know, is there something more? Is there not something more? What does it all mean? And this kind of hands it to you on a shimmering fractal silver platter that says, yeah, did you get it? And that, I mean, if, if everybody could say, yeah, I got it, even if, if it's only once, that has so much radical potential because, you know, again, even in these religious traditions that have promoted the non-dual experience, it's only a small fraction of people within those traditions who actually have the experience, right? That's why Buddha is so unique, right? Because, wow, he was the one who got it. But we, in a sense, we can pass this out to everyone on the planet who's interested in having this experience. And yeah, go ahead. I want to query something around the, uh, hesitancy to go down the path of teleological reasoning because in your own experience as i've described it there was a sort of sense as you sorry as you described it or as i heard it there was a sense of how everything unfolded to this point such that i could take this substance and have this realization which was the realization of what already was already so it sounds like there's a sort of teleology of the personal unfolding i can certainly relate to that in my own experience and I'm wondering why the hesitancy, and I see this in, in other circles as well, to say, yeah, there's purpose. And the purpose is for God to realize itself, for consciousness to become aware of itself. You know, why, why is that um, such a faux pas or, or, or such a, a stigma perhaps in, in intellectual discussion? Well, I like to refer to it as a potential or as an invitation. Um, but I think the danger there's a couple different dangers. One is that then people say, well, then everything's determined. So then I don't really have any choice. I don't really have any free will. And then I'm not responsible for anything and no one's responsible for anything. Um, so that kind of goes down this rabbit hole of causality. And um, also it can be over-determined in the sense that people say, well, this happened so that this could happen. But rather I'd like to say, well, look, when, one th when something happens, it opens up various possibilities and then you still have to exert choice within that um, and then other times people remove responsibility for themselves like well this happened so that this could happen and that's not really up to me um, and i think that really i want to highlight personal responsibility because you do get to choose you do get to make choices and then another area that i think it's very dangerous is in the realm of projection where people for whatever means, they develop a belief that this happened so that this could be true, 
but they don't actually know that, that it's a level of projection um, that's occurring within that. And once we're getting into projections, what you're doing is you're re removing yourself from actual reality and you're spending more and more time in your ideas of what you think is or should be rather than what is. And then that can really, you know, at a pathological level, that's when people are um, completely divorced from reality, when they're just living up in this fantasy land of causality and reasons, you know. So, for example, if we look at the evolution of living beings, I would say that a quote-unquote purpose of evolution is to evolve beings like us, like human beings that do have an ego, who can be self-aware, who can articulate that self-awareness through language, who can remodel reality around them via our hands, and we can make things, we can take reality apart, we can build computers and satellites and rockets, um, we can synthesize chemicals in a laboratory. Um, so the, I think that that is, as a potential, that that's something that evolution moves towards. Mm -hmm. um, but so going back to teleological reasoning, so then we can ask like, well, did the dinosaurs have to die in order to make room for mammals so that mammals could evolve into humans? I mean, was that quote unquote God's plan? And I like to stay away from the idea well, that there's a plan. It's like, no, everything's doing what it can within its scope of what it can do. So quarks do the things that quarks can do, atoms do what atoms can do, molecules do what molecules can do, single-celled single -cell animals do what they can do, multicellular animals do what they can do, human beings do this because we can do this. Um, but so it's not like God was sitting back there and saying, well, the dinosaurs are great, but let's wipe them out with a giant asteroid because I really want to get to those human beings that I'm planning on sometime in the future. That for me, that's just not the way that reality works. That through whatever disaster it was, maybe it was an asteroid, maybe it was massive climate change that wiped out the dinosaurs, that made room the possibility for other life forms to evolve and develop. And that eventually led to human beings. But it's not a causal chain in order to achieve that particular end, right? Again, it's not like God saying, okay, I got to wipe out the dinosaurs to make room for humans several million years down the road. You know, that that's just not the way the system works, that everything works within the potential of any given moment. Um, so that's why I try and stay away from teleological reasoning. So I don't think, for example, I don't think I was destined to have a 5-MeO DMT experience and to have this non-dual experience, but that's a fundamental potential that exists for all human beings. And the choices that I had made in my life and the events that had happened to me steered me in the right direction so that when I was presented with the opportunity to take 5-MeO, for me, it was no question. It's like, yeah, absolutely, I'll do that, right? So in that sense, everything made sense of how it led up to that, but I wouldn't say that I was determined to do that or that that was um, somehow inevitable based on the causal chain of what occurred within my life. I think there are some really powerful and helpful distinctions in what you've shared there. And I wonder if there's something also around the, the value within the individual unfolding of, you know, what is the point? What is the point of this human existence? I, I know this came up for me recently, looking out at this crazy world. What is, what is, my, what is the point of being here? What is the point of continuing to, to live and evolve? And for me, that's where it perhaps has value and relevance is to recognize that within this individual consciousness, there is potential for growth and evolution. And perhaps that's infinite and unfolding. And certainly I'm going to be required to make choices that, uh, that, that uh, impact the rate of that evolution. But it feels like a really helpful answer to the question you know, if, if clients would ever say to me like what's the point of it all um to ask the question what's the point of it all that's a point to be in the inquiry yeah, yeah. and um and, and perhaps to realize the infinite love and pure consciousness of our existence i mean that that would be a pretty fucking good reason to to live to realize fully what we are and yeah. to come into contact with with uh 
with the infinite, with, with, with love. Um, yeah. But what I like to advise people when they ask me about that, because that's another question that I get a lot is like, well, what's the purpose? And because again, a lot of people are coming from a, maybe a spiritual tradition or a religious tradition that, that puts some kind of teleological end, right? That in Christianity, the purpose is to achieve the kingdom of God, right? Or in Buddhism, uh, the purpose is for everybody to become enlightened. And I would say, well, look, that's the potential, but the, the purpose of being is to be, be. <laughs> right? It's just it's like, look, this is it. This is God's game that it's playing. And God's not trying to win or lose. God's just trying to be and play the game, whatever the outcome may be. Now, within that is the potential that you have the potential to wake up to your true nature and to live authentically and responsibly within that. But that's up to you to choose it. No one is ever going to force you to do that. But the invitation is always there. And that God, as this self-actualized being that embodies itself in individual form, I think is interested in achieving its fullest potential. But that's not the purpose per se. That's the possibility within it. And that if everybody actualize that possibility that would make reality happier and more enjoyable for everyone and that even though everything is love war is love destruction is love the species extinction is love but that doesn't um override the fact that friendship and compassion and community and our human notion of love are more pleasant than these other forms of love. And so there's, it's not that the goal of reality is not to make everybody happy, but that's a potential within reality. And since that is the potential, isn't that a goal worth striving for? Because making things more pleasant for everyone is more pleasant. It's not that it's the right thing to do or it's the godly thing to do. It's not required of us, but we have the potential to make things better so why not do that what's holding us back from doing that well what's holding us back from doing that is our attachment to our identity and our belief systems and our judgments and our hates and our fears and our lack of trust etc so if we can overcome that then we can be more motivated to just make things better for people because doesn't that make it more fun isn't that just more enjoyable of an experience i mean if we can lessen suffering for more beings you know, it, that's not the goal of reality, but it's a potential. So why not live up to that potential? And we all know as individual human beings that we enjoy reality more when we feel that we've lived up to our potential, whether it's artistic or intellectual or through our compassionate abilities or whatever it may be, that we feel more satisfied with our lives. If we, if we feel like I really made the most of my time and I made the most of myself or, man, I really wasted my time. I never developed myself that, you know, it, it gives us a sense of satisfaction. And I don't think that there's anything wrong with that, that we have to say, no, no, you can't be satisfied. You know, I, why not? I love the sense of the, the potential and the, the why not, not some great moral imperative or teleological reasoning, which like, why not make things more pleasant? Why not make things more functional? And it feels like a really, um, place to continue a conversation but in terms of this one i think it's a great place to come to conclusion i feel okay. like we've, we've covered a huge amount i'm so grateful for your eloquence and the way you've elucidated some really profound and beautiful points for our listeners and watchers we didn't really get to touch too deeply on to non-dual energetic therapy perhaps another conversation for us but people who yeah. want to find out more about your writings and your books martinball.net um, and the Entheogenic Evolution podcast are two places where people can definitely can connect with you. Martin, thank you so much for giving your time and wisdom and presence today. I really enjoyed the conversation and appreciate it. I've enjoyed it as well. Thank you very much for having me on. And yeah, if you want to uh, have me back sometime, we actually can talk about the energetic therapy, which is a large topic and definitely would, would take quite a bit of time. So um, definitely don't want to get into it today, but I'd love to come back another time if um, you wanted to have me on. But thanks so much for having me. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Martin. 
And thank you everyone for listening and watching. We appreciate your attention and your presence. You can visit loveandtruthparty.org to join our community, download or order love letters, help us distribute the, that million around the world, register for our newsletter, connect on social media, and even consider a financial gift at loveandtruthparty.org. Thank you to all our supporters and contributors. Together, we are creating kind, conscious, courageous human community. Awesome.